Improve your English with chapters 23 and 24 of The Secret Adversary by Agatha Christie. If you like these exercises, subscribe now to get more. Let's begin the reading. Empecemos la lectura. Chapter 23, A Race Against Time After ringing up Sir James, Tommy's next procedure was to make a call at South Audley Mansions. He found Albert discharging his professional duties, and introduced himself without more ado as a friend of Tuppence's. Albert unbent immediately. Things has been very quiet here lately, he said wistfully. Hope the young lady's keeping well, sir? That's just the point, Albert. She's disappeared. You don't mean as the crooks have got her? They have. In the underworld? No, dash it all, in this world. It's a expression, sir, explained Albert. At the pictures the crooks always have a restaurant in the underworld. But do you think as they've done her in, sir? I hope not. By the way, have you by any chance an aunt, a cousin, a grandmother, or any other suitable female relation who might be represented as being likely to kick the bucket? A delighted grin spread slowly over Albert's countenance. I'm on, sir. My poor aunt what lives in the country has been mortal bad for a long time, and she's asking for me with her dying breath. Tommy nodded approval. Can you report this in the proper quarter and meet me at Charing Cross in an hour's time? I'll be there, sir. You can count on me. As Tommy had judged, the faithful Albert proved an invaluable ally. The two took up their quarters at the inn and gatehouse. To Albert fell the task of collecting information. There was no difficulty about it. Astley Priors was the property of a Dr. Adams. The doctor no longer practiced, had retired, the landlord believed, but he took a few private patients, here the good fellow tapped his forehead knowingly balmy ones. You understand. The doctor was a popular figure in the village, subscribed freely to all the local sports, a very pleasant, affable gentleman. Been there long? Oh, a matter of ten years or so, might be longer. Scientific gentleman, he was. Professors and people often came down from town to see him. Anyway, it was a gay house, always visitors. In the face of all this volubility, Tommy felt doubts. Was it possible that this genial, well-known figure could be in reality a dangerous criminal? His life seemed so open and aboveboard. No hint of sinister doings. Suppose it was all a gigantic mistake? Tommy felt a cold chill at the thought. Then he remembered the private patients, balmy ones. He inquired carefully if there was a young lady amongst them, describing tuppence. But nothing much seemed to be known about the patients, they were seldom seen outside the grounds. A guarded description of Annette also failed to provoke recognition. Astley Priors was a pleasant red-brick edifice, surrounded by well-wooded grounds which effectually shielded the house from observation from the road. On the first evening Tommy, accompanied by Albert, explored the grounds. Owing to Albert's insistence they dragged themselves along painfully on their stomachs, thereby producing a great deal more noise than if they had stood upright. In any case, these precautions were totally unnecessary. The grounds, like those of any other private house after nightfall, seemed untenanted. Tommy had imagined a possible fierce watchdog. Albert's fancy ran to a puma, or a tame cobra. But they reached a shrubbery near the house quite unmolested. 
The blinds of the dining room window were up. There was a large company assembled round the table. The port was passing from hand to hand. It seemed a normal, pleasant company. Through the open window scraps of conversation floated out disjointedly on the night air. It was a heated discussion on county cricket. Again Tommy felt that cold chill of uncertainty. It seemed impossible to believe that these people were other than they seemed. Had he been fooled once more? The fair-bearded, spectacled gentleman who sat at the head of the table looked singularly honest and normal. Tommy slept badly that night. The following morning the indefatigable Albert, having cemented an alliance with the greengrocer's boy took the latter's place and ingratiated himself with the cook at Malt House. He returned with the information that she was undoubtedly one of the crooks, but Tommy mistrusted the vividness of his imagination. Questioned, he could adduce nothing in support of his statement except his own opinion that she wasn't the usual kind. You could see that at a glance. The substitution being repeated, much to the pecuniary advantage of the real greengrocer's boy, on the following day, Albert brought back the first piece of hopeful news. There was a French young lady staying in the house. Tommy put his doubts aside. Here was confirmation of his theory. But time pressed. Today was the 27th. The 29th was the much-talked-of Labor Day, about which all sorts of rumors were running riot. Newspapers were getting agitated. Sensational hints of a labor coup d'etat were freely reported. The government said nothing. It knew and was prepared. There were rumors of dissension among the labor leaders. They were not of one mind. The more far-seeing among them realized that what they proposed might well be a death blow to the England that at heart they loved. They shrank from the starvation and misery a general strike would entail, and were willing to meet the government halfway. But behind them were subtle, insistent forces at work, urging the memories of old wrongs, deprecating the weakness of half-and-half -half measures, fomenting misunderstandings. Tommy felt that, thanks to Mr. Carter, he understood the position fairly accurately. With the fatal document in the hands of Mr. Brown, public opinion would swing to the side of the labor extremists and revolutionists. Failing that, the battle was an even chance. The government with a loyal army and police force behind them might win, but at a cost of great suffering. But Tommy nourished another and a preposterous dream. With Mr. Brown unmasked and captured he believed, rightly or wrongly, that the whole organization would crumble ignominiously and instantaneously. The strange permeating influence of the unseen chief held it together. Without him, Tommy believed an instant panic would set in, and, the honest men left to themselves, an eleventh-hour reconciliation would be possible. This is a one-man show, said Tommy to himself. The thing to do is to get hold of the man. It was partly in furtherance of this ambitious design that he had requested Mr. Carter not to open the sealed envelope. The draft treaty was Tommy's bait. Every now and then he was aghast at his own presumption. How dared he think that he had discovered what so many wiser and clever men had overlooked? Nevertheless, he stuck tenaciously to his idea. That evening he and Albert once more penetrated the grounds of Astley Priors. Tommy's ambition was somehow or other to gain admission to the house itself. As they approached cautiously, Tommy gave a sudden gasp. On the second floor window some one standing between the window and the light in the room threw a silhouette on the blind. It was one Tommy would have recognized anywhere. Tuppence was in that house. He clutched Albert by the shoulder. Stay here. When I begin to sing, watch that window. He retreated hastily to a position on the main drive and began in a deep roar, coupled with an unsteady gait, the following ditty. 
I am a soldier. A jolly British soldier. You can see that I'm a soldier by my feet. It had been a favorite on the gramophone in Tuppence's hospital days. He did not doubt but that she would recognize it and draw her own conclusions. Tommy had not a note of music in his voice, but his lungs were excellent. The noise he produced was terrific. Presently an unimpeachable butler, accompanied by an equally unimpeachable footman, issued from the front door. The butler remonstrated with him. Tommy continued to sing, addressing the butler affectionately as dear old whiskers. The footman took him by one arm, the butler by the other. They ran him down the drive, and neatly out of the gate. The butler threatened him with the police if he intruded again. It was beautifully done, soberly and with perfect decorum. Anyone would have sworn that the butler was a real butler, the footman a real footman, only, as it happened, the butler was Whittington. Tommy retired to the inn and waited for Albert's return. At last that worthy made his appearance. Well, cried Tommy eagerly. It's all right. While they was a running of you out the window opened, and something was chucked out. He handed a scrap of paper to Tommy. It was wrapped round a letterweight. On the paper were scrawled three words, tomorrow, same time. Good egg, cried Tommy. We're getting going. I wrote a message on a piece of paper, wrapped it round a stone, and chucked it through the window, continued Albert breathlessly. Tommy groaned. Your zeal will be the undoing of us, Albert. What did you say? Said we was a staying at the inn. If she could get away, to come there and croak like a frog. She'll know that's you, said Tommy with a sigh of relief. Your imagination runs away with you, you know, Albert. Why, you wouldn't recognize a frog croaking if you heard it. Albert looked rather crestfallen. Cheer up, said Tommy. No harm done. That butler's an old friend of mine, I bet he knew who I was, though he didn't let on. It's not their game to show suspicion. That's why we found it fairly plain sailing. They don't want to discourage me altogether. On the other hand, they don't want to make it too easy. I'm a pawn in their game, Albert, that's what I am. You see, if the spider lets the fly walk out too easily, the fly might suspect it was a put-up job. Hence the usefulness of that promising youth, Mr. T. Beresford, who's blundered in just at the right moment for them. But later, Mr. T. Beresford had better look out. Tommy retired for the night in a state of some elation. He had elaborated a careful plan for the following evening. He felt sure that the inhabitants of Astley Priors would not interfere with him up to a certain point. It was after that that Tommy proposed to give them a surprise. About twelve o'clock, however, his calm was rudely shaken. He was told that someone was demanding him in the bar. The applicant proved to be a rude-looking carter well coated with mud. Well, my good fellow, what is it? asked Tommy. Might this be for you, sir? The carter held out a very dirty folded note, on the outside of which was written, Take this to the gentleman at the inn near Astley Priors. He will give you ten shillings. The handwriting was Tuppence's. Tommy appreciated her quick wittedness in realizing that he might be staying at the inn under an assumed name. He snatched at it. That's all right. The man withheld it. What about my ten shillings? Tommy hastily produced a ten shilling note, and the man relinquished his find. Tommy unfastened it. Dear Tommy, 
I knew it was you last night. Don't go this evening. They'll be lying in wait for you. They're taking us away this morning. I heard something about whales, haul ahead, I think. I'll drop this on the road if I get a chance. Annette told me how you'd escaped. Buck up. Yours. Tuppence. Tommy raised a shout for Albert before he had even finished perusing this characteristic epistle. Pack my bag. We're off. Yes, sir. The boots of Albert could be heard racing upstairs. Hall ahead? Did that mean that, after all, Tommy was puzzled. He read on slowly. The boots of Albert continued to be active on the floor above. Suddenly a second shout came from below. Albert. I'm a damned fool. Unpack that bag. Yes, sir. Tommy smoothed out the note thoughtfully. Yes, a damned fool, he said softly. But so someone else. And at last I know who it is. Chapter 24 Julius Takes a Hand In his suite at Claridge's, Kramanin reclined on a couch and dictated to his secretary in sibilant Russian. Presently the telephone at the secretary's elbow purred, and he took up the receiver, spoke for a minute or two, then turned to his employer. Someone below is asking for you. Who is it? He gives the name of Mr. Julius P. Hersheimer. Hersheimer, repeated Kramanin thoughtfully. I have heard that name before. His father was one of the Steel Kings of America, explained the secretary, whose business it was to know everything. This young man must be a millionaire several times over. The other's eyes narrowed appreciatively. You had better go down and see him, Ivan. Find out what he wants. The secretary obeyed, closing the door noiselessly behind him. In a few minutes he returned. He declines to state his business says it is entirely private and personal, and that he must see you. A millionaire several times over, murmured Kramanin. Bring him up, my dear Ivan. The secretary left the room once more, and returned escorting Julius. Monsieur Kramanin? said the latter abruptly. The Russian studying him attentively with his pale venomous eyes, bowed. Pleased to meet you, said the American. I've got some very important business I'd like to talk over with you, if I can see you alone. He looked pointedly at the other. My secretary, Monsieur Grieber, from whom I have no secrets. That may be so, but I have, said Julius dryly so I'd be obliged if you tell him to scoot. Ivan, said the Russian softly, perhaps you would not mind retiring into the next room. The next room won't do, interrupted Julius. I know these ducal suites, and I want this one plum empty except for you and me. Send him round to a store to buy a penneth of peanuts. Though not particularly enjoying the American's free and easy manner of speech, Kramanin was devoured by curiosity. Will your business take long to state? Might be an all-night job if you caught on. Very good, Ivan. I shall not require you again this evening. Go to the theater, take a night off. Thank you, Your Excellency. The secretary bowed and departed. Julius stood at the door watching his retreat. Finally, with a satisfied sigh, he closed it, and came back to his position in the center of the room. Now, 
Mr. Hersheimer, perhaps you will be so kind as to come to the point? I guess that won't take a minute, drawled Julius. Then, with an abrupt change of manner, hands up, or I shoot. For a moment Cramanen stared blindly into the big automatic, then, with almost comical haste, he flung up his hands above his head. In that instant Julius had taken his measure. The man he had to deal with was an abject physical coward, the rest would be easy. This is an outrage, cried the Russian in a high hysterical voice. An outrage. Do you mean to kill me? Not if you keep your voice down. Don't go edging sideways towards that bell. That's better. What do you want? Do nothing rashly. Remember my life is of the utmost value to my country. I may have been maligned. I reckon, said Julius, that the man who let daylight into you would be doing humanity a good turn. But you needn't worry any. I'm not proposing to kill you this trip, that is, if you're reasonable. The Russian quailed before the stern menace in the other's eyes. He passed his tongue over his dry lips. What do you want? Money? No. I want Jane Finn. Jane Finn? I never heard of her. You're a darned liar. You know perfectly who I mean. I tell you I've never heard of the girl. And I tell you, retorted Julius, that little Willie here is just hopping mad to go off. The Russian wilted visibly. You wouldn't dare. Oh, yes, I would, son. Cramanen must have recognized something in the voice that carried conviction, for he said sullenly. Well, granted I do know who you mean, what of it? You will tell me now, right here, where she is to be found. Cramanen shook his head. I daren't. Why not? I daren't. You ask an impossibility. Afraid, eh? Of whom? Mr. Brown? Ah, that tickles you up. There is such a person, then? I doubted it. And the mere mention of him scares you stiff. I have seen him, said the Russian slowly. Spoken to him face to face. I did not know it until afterwards. He was one of a crowd. I should not know him again. Who is he really? I do not know. But I know this, he is a man to fear. He'll never know, said Julius. He knows everything, and his vengeance is swift. Even I, Cramanen, would not be exempt. Then you won't do as I ask you? You ask an impossibility. Sure that's a pity for you, said Julius cheerfully. But the world in general will benefit. He raised the revolver. Stop, shrieked the Russian. You cannot mean to shoot me? Of course I do. I've always heard you revolutionists held life cheap, but it seems there's a difference when it's your own life in question. I gave you just one chance of saving your dirty skin, and that you wouldn't take. They would kill me. Well, said Julius pleasantly, it's up to you. But I'll just say this. Little Willie here is a dead cert, and if I was you I'd take a sporting chance with Mr. Brown. You will hang if you shoot me, muttered the Russian irresolutely. No, stranger, that's where you're wrong. You forget the dollars. A big crowd of solicitors will get busy, and they'll get some highbrow doctors on the job, and the end of it all will be that they'll say my brain was unhinged. I shall spend a few months in a quiet sanatorium, 
my mental health will improve, the doctors will declare me sane again, and all will end happily for little Julius. I guess I can bear a few months' retirement in order to rid the world of you, but don't you kid yourself I'll hang for it. The Russian believed him. Corrupt himself, he believed implicitly in the power of money. He had read of American murder trials running much on the lines indicated by Julius. He had bought and sold justice himself. This virile young American, with the significant drawling voice, had the whip hand of him. I'm going to count five, continued Julius, and I guess, if you let me get past four, you needn't worry any about Mr. Brown. Maybe he'll send some flowers to the funeral, but you won't smell them. Are you ready? I'll begin. One, two, three, four. The Russian interrupted with a shriek. Do not shoot. I will do all you wish. Julius lowered the revolver. I thought you'd hear sense. Where is the girl? At Gate House, in Kent. Astley Priors, the place is called. Is she a prisoner there? She's not allowed to leave the house, though it's safe enough really. The little fool has lost her memory, curse her. That's been annoying for you and your friends, I reckon. What about the other girl, the one you decoyed away over a week ago? She's there too, said the Russian sullenly. That's good, said Julius. Isn't it all panning out beautifully? And a lovely night for the run. What run? demanded Cramanen, with a stare. Down to Gatehouse, sure. I hope you're fond of motoring? What do you mean? I refuse to go. Now don't get mad. You must see I'm not such a kid as to leave you here. You'd ring up your friends on that telephone first thing. Ah! He observed the fall on the other's face. You see, you've got it all fixed. No, sir, you're coming along with me. This your bedroom next door here? Walk right in. Little Willie and I will come behind. Put on a thick coat, that's right. Fur lined? And you a socialist. Now we're ready. We walk downstairs and out through the hall to where my car's waiting. And don't you forget I've got you covered every inch of the way. I can shoot just as well through my coat pocket. One word, or a glance even, at one of those liveried menials, and there'll sure be a strange face in the sulfur and brimstone works. Together they descended the stairs, and passed out to the waiting car. The Russian was shaking with rage. The hotel servants surrounded them. A cry hovered on his lips, but at the last minute his nerve failed him. The American was a man of his word. When they reached the car, Julius breathed a sigh of relief. The danger zone was past. Fear had successfully hypnotized the man by his side. Get in, he ordered. Then as he caught the other's sidelong glance, no, the chauffeur won't help you any. Naval man. Was on a submarine in Russia when the revolution broke out. A brother of his was murdered by your people. George. Yes, sir. The chauffeur turned his head. This gentleman is a Russian Bolshevik. We don't want to shoot him, but it may be necessary. You understand? Perfectly, sir. I want to go to Gate House in Kent. Know the road at all? Yes, sir, it will be about an hour and a half's run. Make it an hour. I'm in a hurry. I'll do my best, sir. The car shot forward through the traffic. Julius ensconced himself comfortably by the side of his victim. 
He kept his hand in the pocket of his coat, but his manner was urbane to the last degree. There was a man I shot once in Arizona, he began cheerfully. At the end of the hour's run the unfortunate Cramanin was more dead than alive. In succession to the anecdote of the Arizona man, there had been a tough from Frisco, and an episode in the Rockies. Julius's narrative style, if not strictly accurate, was picturesque. Slowing down, the chauffeur called over his shoulder that they were just coming into gatehouse. Julius bade the Russian direct them. His plan was to drive straight up to the house. Their Kramanin was to ask for the two girls. Julius explained to him that little Willie would not be tolerant of failure. Kramanin, by this time, was as putty in the other's hands. The terrific pace they had come had still further unmanned him. He had given himself up for dead at every corner. The car swept up the drive, and stopped before the porch. The chauffeur looked round for orders. Turn the car first, George. Then ring the bell, and get back to your place. Keep the engine going, and be ready to scoot like hell when I give the word. Very good, sir. The front door was opened by the butler. Cramanin felt the muzzle of the revolver pressed against his ribs. Now, hissed Julius. And be careful. The Russian beckoned. His lips were white, and his voice was not very steady. It is I, Cramanin. Bring down the girl at once. There is no time to lose. Whittington had come down the steps. He uttered an exclamation of astonishment at seeing the other. You. What's up? Surely you know the plan. Cramanin interrupted him, using the words that have created many unnecessary panics. We have been betrayed. Plans must be abandoned. We must save our own skins. The girl. And at once. It's our only chance. Whittington hesitated, but for hardly a moment. You have orders, from him? Naturally. Should I be here otherwise? Hurry. There is no time to be lost. The other little fool had better come too. Whittington turned and ran back into the house. The agonizing minutes went by. Then, two figures hastily huddled in cloaks appeared on the steps and were hustled into the car. The smaller of the two was inclined to resist and Whittington shoved her in unceremoniously. Julius leaned forward, and in doing so the light from the open door lit up his face. Another man on the steps behind Whittington gave a startled exclamation. Concealment was at an end. Get a move on, George, shouted Julius. The chauffeur slipped in his clutch, and with a bound the car started. The man on the steps uttered an oath. His hand went to his pocket. There was a flash and a report. The bullet just missed the taller girl by an inch. Get down, Jane, cried Julius. Flat on the bottom of the car. He thrust her sharply forward, then standing up, he took careful aim and fired. Have you hit him? cried Tuppence eagerly. Sure, replied Julius. He isn't killed, though. Skunks like that take a lot of killing. Are you all right, Tuppence? Of course I am. Where's Tommy? And who's this? She indicated the shivering Cramanin. Tommy's making tracks for the Argentine. I guess he thought you turned up your toes. Steady through the gate, George. That's right. It'll take him at least five minutes to get busy after us. They'll use the telephone, I guess, so look out for snares ahead, and don't take the direct route. Who's this, 
Did you say, Tuppence? Let me present Monsieur Cramanon. I persuaded him to come on the trip for his health. The Russian remained mute, still livid with terror. But what made them let us go? demanded Tuppence suspiciously. I reckon Monsieur Cramon in here asked them so prettily they just couldn't refuse. This was too much for the Russian. He burst out vehemently. Curse you, curse you. They know now that I betrayed them. My life won't be safe for an hour in this country. That's so, assented Julius. I'd advise you to make tracks for Russia right away. Let me go, then, cried the other. I have done what you asked. Why do you still keep me with you? Not for the pleasure of your company. I guess you can get right off now if you want to. I thought you'd rather I tooled you back to London. You may never reach London, snarled the other. Let me go here and now. Sure thing. Pull up, George. The gentleman's not making the return trip. If I ever come to Russia, Monsieur Cramanon, I shall expect a rousing welcome, and... But before Julius had finished his speech, and before the car had finally halted, the Russian had swung himself out and disappeared into the night. Just a mite impatient to leave us, commented Julius, as the car gathered way again. And no idea of saying goodbye politely to the ladies. Say, Jane, you can get up on the seat now. For the first time the girl spoke. How did you persuade him? she asked. Julius tapped his revolver. Little Willie here takes the credit. Splendid! cried the girl. The color surged into her face, her eyes looked admiringly at Julius. Annette and I didn't know what was going to happen to us, said Tuppence. Old Whittington hurried us off. We thought it was lambs to the slaughter. Annette, said Julius. Is that what you call her? His mind seemed to be trying to adjust itself to a new idea. It's her name, said Tuppence, opening her eyes very wide. Shucks! retorted Julius. She may think it's her name, because her memory's gone, poor kid. But it's the one real and original Jane Finn we've got here. What? cried Tuppence. But she was interrupted. With an angry spurt, a bullet embedded itself in the upholstery of the car just behind her head. Down with you, cried Julius. It's an ambush. These guys have got busy pretty quickly. Push her a bit, George. The car fairly leapt forward. Three more shots rang out, but went happily wide. Julius upright, leant over the back of the car. Nothing to shoot at, he announced gloomily. But I guess there'll be another little picnic soon. Ah. He raised his hand to his cheek. You are hurt? said Annette quickly. Only a scratch. The girl sprang to her feet. Let me out. Let me out, I say. Stop the car. It is me they're after. I'm the one they want. You shall not lose your lives because of me. Let me go. She was fumbling with the fastenings of the door. Julius took her by both arms, and looked at her. She had spoken with no trace of foreign accent. Sit down, kid he said gently. I guess there's nothing wrong with your memory. Been fooling them all the time, eh? The girl looked at him, nodded, and then suddenly burst into tears. 
Julius patted her on the shoulder. There, there, just you sit tight. We're not going to let you quit. Through her sobs the girl said indistinctly. You're from home. I can tell by your voice. It makes me homesick. Sure I'm from home. I'm your cousin, Julius Hersheimer. I came over to Europe on purpose to find you, and a pretty dance you've led me. The car slackened speed. George spoke over his shoulder. Crossroads here, sir. I'm not sure of the way. The car slowed down till it hardly moved. As it did so a figure climbed suddenly over the back, and plunged headfirst into the midst of them. Sorry, said Tommy, extricating himself. A mass of confused exclamations greeted him. He replied to them severally. Was in the bushes by the drive. Hung on behind. Couldn't let you know before at the pace you were going. It was all I could do to hang on. Now then, you girls, get out. Get out? Yes. There's a station just up that road. Train due in three minutes. You'll catch it if you hurry. What the devil are you driving at? Demanded Julius. Do you think you can fool them by leaving the car? You and I aren't going to leave the car. Only the girls. You're crazed, Beresford. Stark staring mad. You can't let those girls go off alone. It'll be the end of it if you do. Tommy turned to Tuppence. Get out at once, Tuppence. Take her with you, and do just as I say. No one will do you any harm. You're safe. Take the train to London. Go straight to Sir James Peel Edgerton. Mr. Carter lives out of town, but you'll be safe with him. Darn you! cried Julius. You're mad. Jane, you stay where you are. With a sudden swift movement, Tommy snatched the revolver from Julius's hand, and leveled it at him. Now will you believe I'm in earnest? Get out, both of you, and do as I say, or I'll shoot. Tuppence sprang out, dragging the unwilling Jane after her. Come on, it's all right. If Tommy's sure, he's sure. Be quick. We'll miss the train. They started running. Julius's pent-up rage burst forth. What the hell? Tommy interrupted him. Dry up. I want a few words with you, Mr. Julius Hersheimer. ¿Te han gustado los ejercicios? Dale a like y suscríbete para no perderte los siguientes videos. También dinos en los comentarios qué tipos de ejercicios quieres ver. Suscríbete a nuestro canal My English Go si quieres encontrar lecciones con explicaciones y estrategias para aprender inglés.